Hello everyone, it's wonderful to be here with you all. Uh, a side effect of being the final talk of the workshop is that I learned a lot over the course of the week in ways that led me to continually add slides to my slide deck. Things really got out of hand there for a while, but I think I've reined it in and gotten this down to 60 minutes of material that I'll deliver in 30. The title of my talk is, Could a Purely Self-Supervised Foundation Model Achieve Grounded Language Understanding? That's meant to be a riff on the wonderful article by the Churchlands from 1991 called, Could a Machine Think? And I'm thinking that my own more elaborate title is a kind of mark of progress in some sense, even if it's kind of confusing at first. The idea is that in the intervening 30 years, we've at least gotten to the point where we can formulate a more specific hypothesis in this space. And I think the hypothesis is at least not trivially false. To make good on that, of course, I need to unpack this. So the first part of my talk will focus on trying to clarify what I mean by these core concepts. I'll roughly define foundation models, that's sort of preliminary. Uh, and then the next two questions are really my focus. Is the learning mechanism used by most present day foundation models, self-supervision, sufficient to achieve grounded language understanding? Self-supervision is the purest form of distributional learning. It's really just trying to learn from co-occurrence patterns of symbols. And so it's not at all obvious that this could lead to a true semantics. And indeed, many people have concluded that it obviously can't lead to a real semantics. So those people answer my title question with a clear no and appeal to intuition to substantiate that idea. Um, but I myself am going to paint a much more optimistic picture. I'm going to be so bold as to say yes and then hedge a little bit. At the very least, no one has presented compelling evidence that the answer is no as of yet. I'm not going to have too much time to talk about the Churchland's piece, but I do want to quickly pull two things out of it. The first part of their article is a response to Searle's Chinese room uh, thought experiment. And their response is essentially that Searle has assumed what he was trying to show. His conclusion is that programs are neither constitutive of nor sufficient for minds, which is of course a direct negation of the core thesis of artificial intelligence. But the axiom that does all the work for him there is axiom three, syntax is neither constitutive of nor sufficient for minds. Uh, and so obviously he's assumed what he intended to show. And I, I think I find that view from the Churchlands per persuasive, but the more important part for me is the second part of their piece, which very clearly envisions the future that we now live in. That part is about neural networks. And let me read this passage from their piece. Searle is aware of neural networks, but thinks they too will be devoid of real semantic content. To illustrate their inevitable failure, he outlines a second thought experiment, the Chinese gym, which has a gymnasium full of people organized into a parallel network. And from there, his argument proceeds as in the Chinese room. We find this second story far less responsive or compelling than his first. If such a system were assembled on a suitably cosmic scale, with all its pathways faithfully modeled on the human case, we might then have a large, slow, oddly made, but still functional brain on our hands. The takeaway for me here is that we should not assume that scale is irrelevant. And to give you a sense for how the Chinese gym would work in 2022, let's reflect briefly on the state of models in AI. This is a chart from a recent influential paper that's actually about making models smaller. Uh, along the x-axis, we have time, and the time depth is not great. It goes to 2018, and in 2018, the largest models had around 100 million parameters. In mid-2019, the sizes start to skyrocket past a billion in the summer and then on up to 8.3 billion in early 2020. But that was already ages ago. Since then, the growth has been astounding. When it was announced, this 8.3 billion parameter Megatron model looked like a typo of some sort to me. And now it's on the small size, right? 11 billion. GPT-3 has 175 billion. And then we have these new 500 billion parameter models that have made a mockery of the y-axis in the original chart from 2019, right? I would need to stack 5,000 slides on top of each other for these 500 billion parameter models to fit on the scale of this original chart. So think of Searle's Chinese gym, a gym containing five times the number of people who have ever lived in all of human history, each getting simple feedback on a simple task via a massive scale but finely orchestrated feedback process. No one can imagine what it would be like to be a Chinese gym, and that is significant. And that's a good segue into my brief discussion of what a foundation model is. I'm not seeking a crisp definition here, but rather only want to give you a sense for what kinds of technologies are out there now. So foundation models are pre-trained, 
multi-purpose models that were designed with adaptability in mind. The designers are probably hoping that the model will have some value out of the box for new tasks and that it might be fine-tuned for specific tasks in a way that leads to better models than you would get if you started from scratch. The best of these models right now are very, very large, as we just saw, but I don't think that's inevitable or definitional. And by the same token, for the most part, these models are trained with some sort of self-supervision, and that's the kind of foundation model that I'm focused on. But I think that too needn't be baked into the definition. Now, you might be wondering why we don't just call these things language models. Well, let me count the ways, right? Language model is a confusing term with a confusing history. For me as a linguist, it feels sort of like an overclaim, uh, even if we do limit to the case where all the data being used are from people's utterances in natural language. But of course, even the things that we still call language models, like GPT-3, were trained on symbol streams that are highly diverse, language, but also metadata, computer code, mathematical notation, and on and on. And language models also incorporate lots of other modalities now very directly, images, audio, video. So if we keep calling these models language models, we're just gonna confuse everyone, probably including ourselves. So I'm a big fan of the term foundation model. And to summarize, a foundation model is a model that's intended to play a foundational role in an AI system. Whether it achieves its intended function is a whole separate question. Since learning word representations has been a consistent theme of the week, I thought I'd just mention that foundation models will learn word representations that are dramatically different from the ones that we can get from older models like word to vec which learn one vector per unique word form qua sequence of characters. These newer contextual models will deliver a different vector for a word for every context that word appears in, and there's lots of evidence that these representations are truly modulated in intuitive and realistic ways by those contexts. And here's a plot to help you give a sense for the potential here. The focus is the word square, and these authors process lots of texts that manifest different senses of square, from a company name to a geographic feature to a geometric shape. And the text they process suggests these different senses, and they've visualized here the resulting vectors for square in particular. And you can see that these representations cluster intuitively based on the semantics, and they may even capture like underlying sense-spanning information related to shared conceptual metaphors and the like across these senses. But we don't need to delimit the senses, right? We really just get a complex landscape of senses, which we can cluster at various levels, all the way down to each word in context being its own unique, subtle beast. And I think this is part of why these models are so successful. And let's see some of that success first here. So here's GPT-3 in action. I prompted it with, in which year was Stanford University founded? When did it enroll its first students? Who is its current president and what is its mascot? And the model responded with a fluent and factually correct answer on all counts. I've set the temperature parameter very low here, so this is almost deterministic for the model, so that should be pretty reproducible. Also in a nod to a famous paper by Hector Levesque called On Our Best Behavior, I prompted it with one of his suggested adversarial questions, sort of like in, Br in Blade Runner. Are professional baseball players allowed to glue small wings onto their caps? And it replied, there is no rule against it, but it is not common. And that seems exactly right to me. So does GPT-3 know what our world is like? Well, so I asked it, would it be possible to hire a team of tamarins to help me paint my house, assuming I'm willing to pay them in sufficient quantities of fruit to meet minimum wage requirements in California? And GPT-3 replied, yes, it would be possible to hire a team of tamarins to help you paint your house. You would need to make sure you are providing them with enough fruit to meet minimum wage requirements, which vary depending on the state in which you live. Helpful in many aspects, but revealing about its model of the world. Relatedly, so DALI 2 was released last week. You might have seen this. It does incredible things. Uh, with a short textual description and some tweaking, you get pictures like these. And I picked these because they seem like novel scenes that suggest the model has a pretty solid grasp of intuitive physics. And these are very impressive bits of evidence, but you know, let's not care, get carried away. Here's Dali 2 failing repeatedly to follow a simple instruction, a blue cube on top of a red cube beside a smaller yellow sphere. It's not even really close. Uh, the pictures are still quite pretty though in their own way, but I think revealing of the world model that Dali is operating on or lack thereof. 
So to round this out, I just wanted to offer a sort of personal reaction. So I like video games and text adventure games. Uh, AI Dungeon is a text adventure game that is at least in part driven by GPT-3 in terms of its language processing and the world you get to explore. And I'm sure that AI Dungeon is on a path to being a really original and interesting new kind of game, a new creative journey for game players. But right now, I feel the sort of bland amusement I get when I play games with small children, where they're just making up the rules as they go along. With AI Dungeon, I don't get a first-order sense of discovery or adventure, and I think it's because the game's AI doesn't have a causal understanding of a world or our world or any world, uh, and so it just genuinely isn't creating a world. It feels chaotic. It seems to have a deep understanding of the causal relationships in language, but not of the world or how language is really used to describe the world. But I see a glimmer of something, and I would bet good money that AI Dungeon will eventually be incredibly compelling and fresh and new. But the question is, is the underlying model architecture and optimization process that we're using now enough to achieve the kind of grounded understanding that we're clearly lacking, at least in the discrete sense, in these cases? And that's really my next big question. Is self-supervision going to be enough to achieve these goals? And now at this point, we can be as precise as we want to be about this definition down to looking at code and pinning down everything if you want to. But I think we needn't go to those depths to make this substantive. So the key idea is that in pure self-supervision, the model's only objective is to learn from co-occurrence patterns in the sequences it's trained on. Or alternatively, you can say that its sole purpose in life is to assign high probability to attested sequences. These models are famous as generators of text, but generation is really a secondary and derivative process. Generation is just sampling from the model in a particular way. For my purposes, the sequences of symbols can contain anything at all, language, computer code, sensor readings, and on and on. The key restriction I want to impose is that the objective for the model cannot mention specific symbols or relations between symbols in particular. Everything needs to be on an equal footing. Let me flesh that out with an example. One path to world-class AI chess is what I've called deeper blue of the future. This model has a structured space of actions and hard-coded rewards. All the symbols have precise interpretations to structure the world and guide the system to maximizing its rewards. And it plays millions of games, and I think this is a recipe for greatness at AI chess. How about what I've called GPT-1000? Here, you just feed in billions of sequences of chess notation using only self-supervision. All the symbols are just symbols, all on the same footing semantically. We allow a bias in the training data for the system to win, but nothing else is constrained here. There's no separate notion of a legal move or reward or anything like that. When playing, the model simply generates new symbols. Can this system be great? I myself, in thinking about this, feel a desperate urge to at least have the phrase white wins have a separate semantics to guide the reinforcement learning at some level. But that is forbidden in pure self-supervision. In pure self-supervision, every symbol just needs to be distributed in the data, just like every other symbol. No special semantics of the sort that I can see would guide the system to success. So we should ask ourselves, though, without that special semantics to structure the world and guide the rewards, could a model like this be successful? I am not sure, but I'm guessing that someone has probably already tried it, so maybe we already have evidence. All right, with these core concepts in place, I feel we can begin to address the full question of whether a purely self-supervised foundation model could achieve grounded language understanding. The final piece is what do we mean by grounded language understanding? Before really diving into that, I feel the need to say one preliminary thing, which is that there is nothing inherent to the idea of semantics that would block a self-supervised system from using language with the intention of being meaningful. David Lewis's famous dictum, semantics with no treatment of truth conditions is not semantics, has indeed become the orthodox position within linguistic semantics and I think within philosophy of language, and that gives it for many people an air of inevitability but it's actually a very narrow view of semantics, and there are lots of other cogent, interesting options. For example, 
Ray Jackendoff is a forceful proponent of a semantics that is entirely representational and uses notions of truth only in very indirect ways. Gerald Katz was even more forceful at times. He talked of the arbitrariness of the distinction between form and matter. Uh, that is, we often can't even distinguish words from the concepts they pick out. And in turn, natural logic is a mature, formalized approach to reasoning in which one defines proof systems entirely on natural language surface forms. These logics often admit of soundness and completeness proofs, but the model theory is optional, and we can construe that as kind of the core claim if we want to. And finally, Will Merrill, currently a PhD student at NYU, has been producing incredible formal results that point to the idea that, within some limits, rich truth conditional semantics can be induced from distributional data with certain biases toward what you might call discourse consistency for the corpus itself. So there, this is all to say that there are rich and interesting conceptions of semantics that even invite the inference, welcome the possibility that self-supervision on symbol streams could suffice for a genuine semantics. With apologies to Lewis, there are many more options than the one he envisioned. In this context, I think it's really interesting to reflect on a thought experiment that Bender and Kohler provide in their influential paper, Climbing Toward NLU from 2020. Bender and Kohler imagine that two humans on a separate deserted islands are communicating with each other through an undersea cable. A super intelligent octopus begins to intercept their communications. The octopus, of course, inhabits a very different world from the humans, and so it doesn't have the sort of experiences needed to ground their utterances in the world. Still, the octopus learns from the patterns in the human's utterances to the point where it can even successfully pretend to be one of the humans and communicate with them. Can the octopus achieve grounded language understanding? On my reading, Bender and Kohler are imagining a kind of adversarial game that will reveal that the answer is no. Whatever the octopus has learned, we can always imagine utterances that it won't understand due to a lack of grounding. Maybe an example like, can I crack a coconut with my eyeglasses is one such utterance, but if it isn't, we can think of others. The guiding assumption seems to be that the complexity of the world is so great that no amount of purely textual exchange can fully cover it, and the gaps will eventually reveal themselves. Now, I actually think that this may be true. However, Bender and Kohler don't address what would happen if the humans interspersed their text exchanges with relevant pictures, video clips, and sensor readings. What would happen then? The octopus could then observe certain associations and begin to achieve what would seem to us, I think, to be a kind of grounded understanding. So if we return to the language models, I think we might grant that it's hard to really understand what, say, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches are and what it means to make them if you have only textual descriptions. But suppose the symbol stream includes demo videos and sensor readings, right? To the model, these will just be streams of symbols. So the model will have to induce the semantic associations in the right ways at the right levels of granularity to kind of align with what we think things mean. But I don't think anyone has offered an argument that that's impossible in principle. And in fact, the success of foundation models kind of suggests to me that it is possible. All right, with those broad roadblocks hopefully moved out of the way, I'd like to refine the core questions a bit further. So how might we think about understanding? I'm sure there are lots of ways, and not all of them are even in competition, um, but I'd like to highlight two really broad views here that I think are especially relevant to AI. The first is a kind of behavioral view, where we say that understanding is purely dispositional and behavioral. The second broad view would go deeper, and there are kind of two variants of this, and both of them require a particular mapping between language and something else that we could call meaning. The internalist view is that understanding amounts to achieving the right kinds of internal representations. That's like Jackendoff. And the referentialist view is that understanding amounts to achieving the right links between language and the world. That's like Lewis. As I said, though, both those views require a specific mapping, a specific causal story about how language and the world relate to each other. And so I'm mostly going to lump them together and just ask the question, how could we determine whether a system had achieved the requisite kind of matching. Okay, with those views in mind, the broader question is how could we determine whether a system had achieved understanding on either of these two broad views of understanding? 
Now, for behavioralism, we just run some behavioral tests, and we do that all the time in AI. However, this is noteworthy. What practitioners actually do in AI is run tests, behavioral tests, and if the system passes them, then they just call the test into question. And I think that reveals a creeping internalism or referentialism, even as we behave like behavior is all that matters. So in the end, I think all of us are going to resort to methods that one would use for internalism and referentialism. That would be structural analysis and assessment methods. We want to peer inside these so-called black boxes. So with that in mind, let me start to wrap up here by offering some practical advice and concrete results that relate to these different conceptions of understanding and how to probe for it. First, in the behavioral mode, I just want to remind everyone that foundation models are sort of alien creatures. What's intuitive for us may not be intuitive for them, but that alone is not evidence that they lack intelligence. For example, if you just prompt the foundation model with the question, what is pragmatics? And it replies, what is semantics? Who are you to say that that was wrong? Your prompt was consistent with numerous underlying intentions, perhaps, well, for all the model knows, you wanted to riff with it on the topic of linguistics. So we've all seen this and learned that prompt construction is important. What we might do is teach the model in context what our intentions are by giving it a few examples to nudge it toward a response that will align with our, our intentions. Here's another example. Suppose I want to see whether a foundation model understands basic aspects of reasoning in language. There's an established task for that called natural language inference or NLI. For NLI, you're given a premise hypothesis pair and asked to label it as entailment, contradiction, or neutral. It's very tempting with a foundation model to try to convert that task directly into a prompt, as I've done here on the left. But no present day models, as far as I know, are good at this, not without some task specific training. Does that mean that they don't know how to do this basic reasoning? Well, maybe, but the inference there would be too hasty. If you formulate these problems as questions with constrained answers, as I've done on the right, then they do much better. And perhaps that shouldn't surprise us. After all, these models experienced a lot of the kinds of language that you see on the right during training, whereas what's on the left is very unusual in their overall experiences. And by the way, the task on the left is much harder for humans, too, than the task on the right. So here it might just be that the AI researchers are confusing everyone and everything. But I think we're learning how to communicate with these foundation models. I'm also very optimistic about structural analysis methods as providing a window into the solutions that these models have found. One of the first structural analysis methods to make a splash in the BERT era was probing. In probing, one targets an internal representation in a target model to see whether that representation encodes a specific kind of information of interest. And the probe itself is a small supervised linear model that's trained on the representations that the target model creates at the point where you're probing. And if the probe succeeds at that supervised learning task, we have some evidence that the probed information is at least partly latent in that internal representation. Strikingly, probes like these yielded a lot of evidence that BERT itself has latent in its representations a lot of very rich linguistic information. So this plot on the right here is from a famous paper, Tenney et al. 2019. The x-axis corresponds to the layers of the BERT model, and the panels show different tasks like part of speech, dependency parsing, named entities, semantic roles, and so forth. And all these pieces of information seem to emerge systematically in different places in the network. This is really striking because remember, this is a BERT model that was not trained for any of these tasks. It was trained only via self-supervision. And so it seems that we have evidence that latent in the distributions of symbols it was trained on, the model can find this rich structural information about language. I found this incredibly eye-opening, and I think it should be receiving much more attention from linguists and cognitive scientists and so forth, especially people who are prone to talking a lot about the poverty of stimulus. We can go deeper, though. A limitation of probing is that it can't provide causal insights. It can't guarantee that the information found by the probe plays any role in the input-output behavior of the network. To achieve causal insights, we really need to explore counterfactual states that the network might be in, and that's the focus of our ongoing work on causal abstraction and intervention-based training. To illustrate, 
Let's suppose we have the neural network on the right here. It takes in three numbers, does some mysterious internal computations, and ultimately outputs the sum of those three numbers. How does this network work? We might hypothesize that it has a kind of internal compositionality to it, as reflected in the simpler causal model here. The model sums the first two numbers to create an intermediate state S1, and then it adds that together with a copy of the third input to produce the output sum. Is this causal model an abstraction of the lower level neural model? To answer that question, we hypothesize an alignment between variables and then conduct interchange interventions. For example, suppose we hypothesize that the L3 variable here performs the same role as the S1 variable in the causal model. The needed interchange intervention in the causal model computes two sets of inputs, and then it replaces the S1 from the first example with the computed value at S1 in the second example. And we know exactly what this will do since the causal model is easy to understand. The network on the left will now output 14. Okay, but then we do the same on the neural network where we have no guarantees at all. What will happen? If the corresponding swap at L3 leads the network to compute 14 for inputs 1, 3, 5, but with this intervention, then we have a piece of evidence that the network is storing the sum of the first two inputs at L3, which is the role of the S1 variable. And if this works for all possible inputs to the network, then we've shown that L3 is a modular encoding of the sum of the first two inputs. In a real neural network, this might be incredibly abstract as a representation, this L3, but if its causal role in the network behavior is the same as that of, L of S1 in the simpler model, then we can start to reason instead about that simpler model and forget all about the complexities of this black box neural one. Now we can do the same for a hypothesis about how to relate L1 in the neural network with an intermediate variable W in the causal model that encodes the third input. Right, we perform an intervention in our causal model at the double var w variable and we record the new output. And then we perform the same intervention on L1 in the network. And if that leads to the same new output as we get from the causal model, then we're starting to get evidence that L1 indeed encodes the W variable and so forth. And if we perform interventions at L2 and always find that nothing happens, then we've established that L2 plays no role in the network's behavior. And in this way, we've built up evidence and maybe even shown in a strong sense that the causal model is a faithful abstraction of the underlying neural network. And then, of course, if we've shown that, we're safe to forget about that messy neural network and reason entirely about the model that we do understand. So to wrap this up, let me just go beyond my toy example and mention a few ways in which these ideas have been put into action in large scale neural networks uh, for problems in AI. So we've shown that fine-tuned BERT models succeed at hard out-of-domain examples involving lexical entailment and negation because they are abstracted by simple monotonicity programs. We've shown that models succeed at the very hard versions of the MNIST pointer value computer vision task because they are abstracted by simple programs like if the digit is six, then the label is in the lower left, which is the structure of the pointer value problem, one part of it. And we can now go beyond the sort of passive study that I just showed you and use that same interchange intervention methodology to train neural models to better conform to the high-level causal models that we have in mind. And that's very exciting. And so this leads me to my final claim. If a foundation model succeeds at hard language generalization tasks in some domain and simulates a high-level causal model of that domain and the language used to describe it, then surely it has achieved grounded language understanding in that domain. It's not clear to me what else there could be to this notion of grounded language understanding. And it's essentially that nuance claim, together with the evidence that I presented earlier, that lead me to answer yes to the question, could a purely self-supervised foundation model achieve grounded language understanding? A fairly confident yes. Thank you.